In this video, I'm going to talk about how to write a journal paper and submit it and perhaps hopefully how to publish it. Uh, there are a few important principles that we need to take into consideration, but I think uh, what I'm going to share with you is not new and you already know about that, but I think it's always good to re remember and review what we know. Um, I also should say that I'm shooting this from home, uh, this video from home, and you might hear some background noise. Uh, out of my control really. I'm sorry about that if you hear anything. Uh, so the first thing that we need to take into consideration is the development of a theoretical framework. A theoretical framework that justifies the research questions that we uh, actually pose and investigate in, in the paper. A theoretical framework should have a laser beam focus on one specific topic that we are investigating. Uh, for example, if you're investigating the effect of using uh, test methods, for example, like multiple choice questions or open-ended questions on the measurement of reading comprehension or other, or other types of language skills, try to zoom in onto these variables or these concepts only. That's uh, the effect of, that's the uh, uh, multiple choice questions versus open-ended questions within the context of reading comprehension assessment. So it's not a good idea to uh, define your theoretical framework uh, very broadly uh, to include a lot of different variables uh, which may or may not necessarily be related to what you're investigating. That's point one. Point two is um, it's a very useful idea to use a database. A database, uh, of course, Google Scholar provides you with uh, very good uh, coverage of uh, the papers that have been published but you can also use databases like the Web of Science or my favorite which is Scopus because it has a very broad coverage and you can find a lot of papers and books and book chapters even uh, conference proceedings and so on and so forth that would be relevant to the topic that you're investigating and uh, um, actually you can keep narrowing it down uh, further to identify you know, an, a good amount of uh, research that has been published uh, on the field that you're investigating. We have created about five videos um, on how to use a database and of course Scientometrics, but maybe the first two videos which are about how to use the Web of Science can be helpful. Uh, if you haven't watched them, I suggest that uh, you take a look and they are available within the same channel. Uh, the other thing that uh, you would need to do is to identify a research gap. A research gap is uh, like uh, um, um, you know something that has not been investigated before or if it has been investigated there is not enough convincing evidence or convincing data to show uh, that for example certain variable can be changed as a result of the change in another variable and so on and so forth. That research gap is important for you because based on the gap you're going to formulate your research questions. Uh, now that let's say you have uh, identified the research gap and you have uh, written down a very good research question, the next step will be to write the methodology section. Uh, one of the important sections under methodology is the uh, the uh, definition and description of your sample. For example, the sample size, the gender distribution, uh, maybe the age, the average age, the standard deviation, and so on and so forth. But it's also very important to, to consider discussing why you chose that sample. Um, you know, I happen to review quite a few papers uh, for uh, different journals maybe every month. Something that I often see miss, missing in some, some of these papers, not all, is the fact that um, some authors forget to mention why they chose that sample. Was it because it was really convenient to collect the data from the sample? Or uh, did they have a different reason for choosing that sample over other p uh, possible samples within a population? You need to extrapolate from your sample to a population. Therefore, you need to discuss how that sample is probably representative of a broader population. That's something that I would recommend that you should take into consideration. Because the results that you uh, get from the analysis of the data coming from your small sample uh, is not just interesting um, because it was 
uh, related to and relevant to your sample, but it has to be actually relatable to a broader sample. That's uh, the population. So try to create that link between the sample and the population that you have in mind. Uh, the next step is actually procedures that uh, you're supposed to explain how the data was collected, what kind of instruments were used. By instruments here, I'm specifically referring to measurement instruments if you're doing a quantitative kind of study. Um, for measurement instruments, I suggest that you discuss their reliability. Actually, it's, it's uh, perhaps more precise to say that you should discuss the reliability of the data that was collected uh, by using that instrument. Uh, let's say you are uh, using an instrument that has been um, developed in a different context. Yeah, you should say that you adopted it from another context, but also you should provide evidence that the data that were collected using that instrument in your context are also reliable. Uh, th which means that if uh, the instrument had a high reliability index or statistic, in the previous context, it doesn't necessarily mean that it would be reliable for your context as well. Therefore, you should provide evidence that uh, this instrument that you used, for example, a test or a, a survey or some kind of observation form, was equally or similarly reliable in the context of your study. Well, when it is done, um, then you could also perhaps discuss whether it's psychometrically valid. But I recommend that you just spend maybe a very small a part of your uh, paper on discussing the psychometric validation or psychometric validity of the instrument because the main aim is not that. That's actually just something to uh, you know, show that the instrument you are using um, um, are actually reliable and valid for the purposes that they have been developed for. Now, following that, you need to uh, start writing your data analysis uh, section and also the results section. Now, these sections are uh, quite related to each other, and I'm often asked uh, whether it's a good idea to use sophisticated uh, quantitative techniques that are used uh, in, in, let's say, language assessment or is some research in language learning and second language acquisition. Examples are um, and it's not exclusive, but, you know, things like rush measurement or different types of cognitive diagnostic models or uh, structural equation modeling and, and, you know, factor analysis and so on and so forth. And, um, my answer is not necessarily. You don't have to use these uh, techniques in order to be able to publish your papers. Actually, there are many good and well-written papers with solid theoretical uh, justifications that have not used these uh, techniques, which means that um, using these techniques does not necessarily mean that uh, your paper is going to be published. That's one thing. Uh, it's very important to remember that when we are doing research, that there should be a consistency between the research question and the choice of the quantitative technique. You might be able to use uh, like simple methods, simple in quotations, because that's just really a perception, simple methods to, um, uh, to answer your research questions pretty well and draw very good and, and justifiable conclusions uh, and also make a significant contribution to that field. Uh, so. Uh, I would recommend that whatever technique you use, uh, you um, investigate it and research it properly because a lot of um, statistical methods that we use, uh, especially the parametric ones or even the psychometric methods like rush measurement or cognitive diagnostic models, do have assumptions. Make sure that you provide evidence that the assumptions were met. Now we have made quite a few videos about the assumptions of different statistical methods and actually you can go through the channel, browse through those videos and, and find uh, different assumptions of different statistical methods. Finally, uh, after uh, writing the uh, results section, you need to start to, um, to discuss. To discuss 
what your conclusions and findings exactly mean and uh, what are the implications and how they actually make a contribution to the field you're investigating. That takes a little bit of time because I think, in my opinion, as a reviewer of papers, uh, that's a section that I zoom in on quite carefully and read it very carefully when I'm reviewing a paper or a dissertation or a thesis because that means how you have put together the findings of your study and you contextualize it and synthesize it with the available research that you have uh, already reviewed uh, under the literature review of the paper. Therefore, you should be able to address the gap again and tell the reader how your study closed the gap or how you, the study at least addressed the gap or started to address the gap and what kind of contributions it made to the field. What did we learn that we didn't know before? And what is the utility, what's the use of the thing that we have learned? Is it good for this theory building, which is a good thing, or is it good for both theory building and also for uh, useful for practitioners? In other words, practitioners like language testers or language teachers can also use these results in their classrooms or in the development of the assessments, uh, that uh, the development of the assessment that they are supposed to uh, you know, develop. So finally, uh, a conclusion, which, uh, which is actually a, a relatively short part of your essay or your paper, uh, which um, pulls together everything that you have done, provides a very brief overview of the study and investigation, and um, sometimes you can actually discuss the limitations of your study under conclusion. Some authors prefer to have a separate section for the limitations of the study. Um, I, to me, either will do as long as uh, the argument reads well and smoothly. Um, so let's recap. Number one, we should have a good theoretical framework. Uh, and then we should identify the gap Number two, we should craft or formulate good research questions. Then number three will be the methodology under which you're going to have uh, the sample plus uh, the instruments, procedures, data, data analysis. And number four will be your results section where you're supposed to uh, present what you have found in your data analysis. And number five is going to be your discussion. And number six, conclusion or conclusion and limitations. Don't forget to have a uh, section to present all the uh, references or citations that you have made in your text. That's the references section. That brings me to the end of this video. In the future I will make more videos uh, and I'll be more specific, for example, how to write a good, uh, a good paper where you're using the Rush measurement or how to write uh, a publishable paper where you have used, for example, structural equation modeling and so on and so forth. Uh, till then, stay tuned in and have a good day.